This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. He won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. Jack Davis is on this edition of Conversations. Jack Davis's day job is that of a professor at the University of Florida. But a quick glance at his resume reveals an impressive career outside of the classroom. In 2018, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. But he is far from a one-hit wonder. His books, Race Against Time, Culture and Separation in Natchez Since 1930, and an Everglades Providence, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the American Environmental Century have earned their own place on the literary landscape, garnering an array of award, awards and accolades. He is currently working on a book about one of our nation's great symbols, the bald eagle. We welcome the Pulitzer Prize winning Jack Davis to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Well, first of all, congratulations on the Pulitzer. That's a big deal. Thank you, yes. Uh... <laughs> I, I want to. I, I read something. Tell me. And I want you to tell the story, and then okay. I want to get into the book. But I, when you found out mm -hmm. that you had won the Pulitzer Prize, take me back. What what you were doing, and how did you find out about it? So I was on campus in my office in a meeting with a, a graduate student, um, and it's near the end of the semester, and I was reading him the riot act about <laughs> his sloppy writing all through the semester, and uh, my office phone started ringing off the hook. My cell phone started ringing and, and uh, of course, exploding with, with texts. And I had no idea what was going on. I wasn't aware that my, my book had even been nominated. Um, the poster wasn't on my radar. Now, I'm getting a little irritated because I'm having a good time reading the riot act to this guy. I'm taking, <laughs> you know, all semester I've been dealing with, it, you know, the same mistakes. And finally, uh, I started worrying about the possibility of an emergency. So I turned around and looked at, picked up my cell phone and saw a text from my editor saying I had won. Wow. And I stood up and I said, holy, you blank, blank. Uh -huh. uh, and then I literally went speechless. Uh, I don't think that's ever happened. And I couldn't tell the graduate student what happened. So I had to slide the phone across the desk so he could... Um, read the text. His <laughs> eyes bugged out, and I know what he was thinking. He was saying, meeting's over. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so that's, that's how I learned. Wow, that's, that's a funny story. So at that point, he had to think, well, maybe I should pay attention to what this guy's telling me. <laughs> you know, the, the final draft was due the next week, and it was perfect. Really? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. A, well, you probably, that was probably a big impression on him, I would imagine. I mean, what, how, I mean that's pretty neat when you think about it. Yeah, yeah it is, is, is pretty neat. It's, um, it's, life, it's been life-changing. Uh -huh. um, it... Um, uh, it, it has felt, people ask me, how does it feel to win the Pulitzer? <laughs> it feels like somebody else's life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, pr pretty extraordinary. It, it, beyond my, all my expectations really? for, for this book, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. or for myself. Wow. So, so that was not something you, you thought of coming up as a, as a young student, that, wow, I'm going to, that's a goal for me or something? No, no, absolutely uh, not. You know, yeah. in high school, if somebody told me I was going to write books, I would say, you're crazy. And if they'd say, it told me you'll win the Pulitzer Prize someday, I would have said, what's a Pulitzer? Right. <laughs> and uh, no, I never, I, I, you know, I don't allow myself to think that highly of myself. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, again, the book had done, done well, it, 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 even before the Pulitzer, it had, got, it had gotten uh, wonderful national reviews. It had won another major award, but uh, again, I wasn't, I had no expectation that the book would even be in the running for the, the, the Pulitzer. And the thing about Pulitzer is they don't announce the finalists in advance of announcing the winner. So nobody knows right. who's actually in the running uh, until the day they are announced. Uh, and a lot of people learn, long, <laughs> learn before I did. Wow. 
Well, well congratulations. Yeah, that's, thank a, that's you. a wonderful yeah. accomplishment. You know, Jeff, you know, I, I, for me, it's less about the Pulitzer is less about me than it is the, uh, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, right. It's less about the book than right. about the Gulf of Mexico. I, I think this is wonderful, positive national publicity yeah. for the Gulf of Mexico, which it doesn't get all the time. Right. You know, it gets the headlines when there's a hurricane or right. an oil spill. Right. And that's on, one reason why I wrote this well, book. Well, speaking of that, tell me, what was the inspiration for you to write this book? Well, I, I grew up on the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, so I have this lifelong um, intimate relationship with the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, when I realized that some, nobody had written a comprehensive history of the Gulf of Mexico, I saw a need there, but I also, also saw a natural fit for me. Um, and writing this book was really a labor of love um, and a true privilege because um, the, the Gulf has meant so much to me as as you know, m most people in sure. the, your view viewing absolutely. audience. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I, uh, I spent my part of my early uh, preteen years on Santa Rosa Sound in Fort Walton Beach, and then um, uh, and then later on Choctahatchee Bay. And as I was writing this book, um, I was revisiting my childhood in Okaloosa yeah. County. Um, almost every day when I'd sit down to write, I was revisiting that childhood and really understanding how important those, those years on those two waters were, were, were to me. We, I didn't, on, living on Santa Rosa Sound, I didn't live in a baby boomer neighborhood, so right. there were no kids to play with. Right. What I had was the, the sound. I like to say that the, the sound was the cul-de-sac of my youth and the, you know, the docks were my, my streets and sidewalks and, um, you know, a, 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 a little boat was my, my bicycle and my rod and reel were my, my bat and ball. Right. Uh, right. And it was just a wonderful, a wonderful way to live those early years. Do you have, when you, when you said that, it made me think back just on, on some personal stuff. Do you have a favorite time of day to be on the Gulf or, or whether it's on the beach or actually in the water? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's changed over the years. I think um, t now my favorite time to be on the Gulf is is sunset. Yeah. Uh, you can't. You know. You can't. There, there, there are no better sunsets <clears throat> in the world. Yeah. Um, and um, but uh, sunset and early morning because early morning, uh, both early morning sunset, the birds are, yeah. are more active. Yeah. And I love to sit there and watch them as I'm waiting, watching the the, the light change as the sun is rising, or watching the the sun fall behind uh, right. the Gulf. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. That's I think that's my favorite time as well. But in my youth, of course, it was beer drinking. Time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was from sun up to yeah, sundown, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You know, we were talking off set or off camera, and you said that you spent a good portion of the uh, right uh, of the, your time writing this book actually in down in South Walton County, right? Yes, I um, I had a fellowship for a month. Uh, Escape to Create, which is uh, in, in Seaside. And uh, it's a wonderful program for, a uh, fellowship program for artists and, and writers and creative people. Yeah. And thus the name Cre uh, Create to Escape. And uh, it was, so I spent a month there writing, I, I wrote uh, chapter five okay. uh, while I was there. And what happens in Escape to Create is the, the people who own the homes in Seaside, majority of them are are only are absentee owners right, or right. or you know part time right, um, right. or seasonal, right. and so in the winter time, which is not a great season to, uh, necessarily for uh, people from um, uh, other states to be there, uh, they let the the Escape to Create program use their houses or their cottages. Each one has a cottage behind right. uh, the house uh, uh, for a uh, for a fellow. Yeah, well, so that's that's neat. As you were doing your research and as you were writing this book, what did you learn that most surprised you that you did you just didn't know? You go, wow, I didn't know that. And that's I learned so much, um, and but I suppose what I, I learned this is an environmental history, of course, focusing on the five U.S. states, um, covering the period from uh, geological formation to the present. So not not very ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think uh, what what's the what impressed me I'll say is, are a couple of things. One is how important the estuarine environment is to the Gulf of Mexico. It's one of the richest estuary, estuarine environments in the world, and it's not just ecologically important; it's economically important. Yeah. We've got a twenty-plus billion-dollar commercial fishing industry in the, in the U.S. Gulf, 
because of those estuaries. We have a five plus billion dollar sport fishing industry because of those estuaries. It is, the Gulf is the most popular saltwater sport fishing area in America because of those estuaries. And, but those estuaries are connected to 60% of the lower U.S. by way of rivers that drain um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the majority of the, the lower U.S. And so whatever goes in those rivers comes down to those estuaries, good or bad. Right. Of course, the good is the fresh water, the good is the nutrients, and the good is the sediment when it, right. when it gets there. The bad is the pollution, yeah. unfortunately. And you talked about that some, and fertilizer in particular, right? Mm, yes. Yeah, what's the story with that? What, what's, what's going on? How much of it is getting into the Gulf? Well, unfortunately, fertilizer, both agricultural and, and uh, home-use fertilizer, um, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't stay... Um, where it's put down, uh, mm -hmm. or at least 100% doesn't stay. Uh, it washes away in the rains, uh, ends up in streams and rivers, um, and fertilizer from as far away as the Dakotas or Minnesota will find its way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, or fertilizer from as far away as the foothills of the Rocky Mountains uh, mm -hmm. will wash down to the Texas coast. Um, and of course, you know, in Florida, uh, we have the issue with Lake Okeechobee and the Caloosahatchee River. Lake Okeechobee drains a, a significant, a very large agricultural region of, of Florida, and our principal agricultural region. And, and, um, and the fertilizer, the cow waste, washes into Lake Okeechobee, and then the Army Corps of Engineers and State Water Engineers send that down the Caloosahatchee River and the St. Lucie on the Atlantic side, uh, down into those estuarine environments. And it's, it, ha it has a horrific uh, impact. Again, not just e ecological, also economical. Right. Um, and now, let me state that the majority of farmers are, you know, uh, are very have a very close relationship to the, to the natural world, right. uh, and they are as keen supporters as, as anybody sure. else of, of of a clean environment. Right. Um, and but there are some challenges, and and I think um, uh, agriculture is facing those challenges and. Uh, uh, starting to try to do the right thing. Right, right. I think there's a lot of move on these days too with like the no-till farming and things of that nature, which uh, I guess perhaps cuts down on some erosion, but then probably more chemicals are involved, huh? So, you know, well, yeah. with, with no-till, it's generally less, uh, less chemicals because oh, okay. you're, 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 uh, you are keeping the nutrients that would normally be taken off the land on the land uh, and, or, or on that crop field. And uh, so you, ultimately what happens is you, you can often use less water and, and less fertilizer. In okay. some cases, no fertilizer at all. Okay. Some people are going to no fertilizer and going to what's called regeneration farming, not just sustainable farming, but regenerative farming or perma farming. Um, and so your, your input is actually greater than your output. In, in other words, you're putting more nutrients into the land than what you are, are removing, or more uh, caloric substance into the land than what you are, are removing. And, and we're, we're veering off course here just a little bit, but you're yeah, environmental yeah, bit, at the University of Florida, so now I'm curious, so how are they doing that? How is that happening? I mean, I'm familiar with kind of, to some degree, the no-till stuff, but like what you're talking about, where they're putting, how, how's that working? Well, um, part of it, and most farmers are, are or have now moved to no-till or, uh, or less till or mm -hmm. minimal till. Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, the way to regenerate a lot of those nutrients is through uh, uh, using cover crops, and, and many farmers do that, right. but also rotating, if you have them, uh, rotating your, your, your livestock, okay. uh, your grazing livestock, mm -hmm. so they can move also the nutrients from one place to, to the other. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Here's the other question I have for you about the Gulf of Mexico. We take a tremendous amount of pride in how beautiful our beaches are from, you know, Pensacola to, you know, Destin, South Walton County, Panama City on down and around Florida. Why is there such a difference between how our beaches look on the, on the Gulf Coast of Florida here and say, Corpus Christi, Texas. Those rivers, um, because where does that quartz white, that beautiful white quartz sand that we have on our beaches here come from? Yeah. Uh, to the top of the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians were as tall as the Himalayans at one time, and uh, glaciers and and uh, rain and winds brought that uh, that um, uh, quartz down to the Gulf of Mexico by way of rivers. Um, the Apalachicola River, for instance, yeah. uh, is a major 
has been a major deliverer historically of the white quartz. Uh, but in Texas, you have the Rio Grande, the Brazos, and the Colorado primarily bringing sediment from as far away as the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And whatever terrain uh, those rivers pass through, they pick up sediment. And the sediment, uh, the mineral content is different over there okay. than from, from over here. We just happen to be lucky enough to be endowed with, with white quartz yeah. on, this, on this side of the United States. Interesting. Nice now, and of course, you've seen beaches in Louisiana. And uh, Louisiana has this beautiful um, uh, marsh, co uh, coastal marshes, uh, unsurpassed in the United States, but it has the ugliest beaches. Yeah. Uh, I like to say, have you ever seen a plowed field in Iowa? Well, that's the future <laughs> Louisiana beach. That's the way it looks. Yeah. What did, how much damage did the BP oil spill do to the Gulf of Mexico? The BP oil spill did significant damage and the, you know, the jury's still out because we don't know necessarily what will happen in the future. There's still uh, a lot down there at the, the bottom of the, the Gulf of Mexico. But you know, what I write, in, as I write in the book and as I, I say in my, my talks, the BP oil spill is not the, the worst environmental disaster that the Gulf of Mexico has suffered. Every day is an environmental disaster that exceeds the BP oil spill. Really? When we factor in everything that is put into those rivers from far away places, again, from as far away as western New York to North Dakota to the Rocky Mountains, whatever's put in those rivers makes its way down the Gulf, and that's on a daily basis. The infrastructure for the gas and oil industry is more destructive than oil spills and than, than the offshore facilities. Um, and then, of course, you have all sorts of industry and agriculture uh, around uh, the Gulf of Mexico. But also you have engineering projects that have disrupted uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the currents, the near shore currents, uh, which redirects the sediment that revitalizes our, our, our beaches, this ecology that is our economy. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and, of course, can diminish the, the health of a, an estuary, estuary as well. Uh, so when you factor all that in, the, the daily insult is, is more significant, unfortunately. Uh -huh. But let me emphasize, uh -huh. I, I, I have a, uh, I'm optimistic. I have a positive outlook on, on the future of the Gulf. I think we've, we, we are, for the most part, m moving in the right direction. Every, virtually every bay and bayou around the Gulf of Mexico by the late 1960s was on the verge of death, death because of pollution. Uh, we've fixed that for the most part. Most of those bays and bayous have been brought back to vital life, teeming with fish once again, teeming with birds as, as a consequence. Uh, some of them enjoyed 100% uh, seagrass uh, regrowth where, when, when they'd lost 60, 70% of their, their seagrass. We did the right thing with the Clean Water Act. Everybody pitched in business, mm -hmm. agriculture, volunteers. Uh, and we, if we did it once, we can do it again. And we have every nearshore body of water around the Gulf of Mexico has one or two nonprofit group that works very hard uh, to maintain uh, the health of those or, or to restore it mm -hmm. of those bodies of water. Right here in Pensacola, you've got the Marine Fishermen's Association, which dates back to 1960, 19, 1970, right. during the, the massive mish, fish kills right. here. They've just done tremendous work as well as many other people. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. What does a hurricane do to the Gulf? Well, the, the hurricane um, obviously causes, as far as ecological, we know what it does to our infrastructure, sure, sure. to the built environment. Right. Uh, as far as ecologically, <clears throat> it can obviously have its impact. But nature, nature does itself to itself. Uh, it will it will destroy it will it will destroy in some way uh, a vital ecosystem or diminish its its health. Um, but you know, with destruction, there's always rebirth, and it's immediate. Right. Um, and Walter Anderson, the, the famous Gulf artist who lived in, uh, in uh, Ocean Springs, Mississippi, he spent most of his time on barrier islands painting and keeping a journal. He loved intense weather because he was, uh, he was so curious about the rebirth that came after the destruction. Wow. Uh, and he was, it always amazed him. And you focused on him in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I he, chapter 12 was the, uh, he's the narrative driver in chapter 12, if, if you will. And uh, he, um, that was the first chapter I wrote for the book. I knew that Walter would show me the way into this book. Yeah. He showed me how to write about the Gulf of, of Mexico. I knew about him long before from one of my previous books, yeah. uh, only in Mississippi, uh, Backroads Travel Guide to, to the State. I knew about Walter Anderson from that, a book I co-authored back in the 1990s, and, uh, 
and I knew he was the guy to start with. What kind of character is he? He's, you know, he was this reclusive uh, artist. Uh, he had a family, but he, uh, he, his, which he, which he, he loved, and his family loved him. But he had a second family, if you will, and that was that was the uh, Gulf nature. Uh, he spent most of his last twenty years of, of his life uh, on these barrier islands off the coast of Mississippi, uh, not populated by humans, but very inhabited. Uh, inhabited, uh, there's no such thing as an inhabited island because right. there's life on there. Right, right. And this is what Walter Anderson um, uh, understood and appreciated, and that's what drew him to those islands. He wanted to be there. That was his, that was his re- very much those islands and that wildlife were his second home and family. Right, right. And you're quite fascinated by barrier islands. I am fascinated by, by barrier islands. They, they play an important role in, uh, in, in um, the Florida economy and the, uh, the Gulf economy. They are important to the estuarine environment because they help cordon in the fresh water and salt water mix. Uh, and uh, they are st- uh, stopover areas for migrating birds. A billion, a billion birds migrate across or around the Gulf every year. A billion? Yes, and, and a lot of those go direct over the Gulf, nonstop. They can be in the air 25, 30 hours. I'm talking about little songbirds. I'm talking about warblers. I'm talking about uh, hummingbirds. Uh, I'm not talking about these these big seabirds that spend right. their life over the water for years at, at, a, at a time. Wow. Um, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. That is remarkable. Yeah. It's quite amazing. And I loved writing about that and learning yeah. about that and writing about it. But, you know, orth- ornithologists didn't believe that, that birds, songbirds, could uh, fly directly across the Gulf until 1945. And, and a ornithologist from uh, LSU uh, uh, proved that go, uh, that indeed birds did fly direct across the. How Gulf. did he prove it? Well, he he got out there in a boat. He got he he hopped a ride on a Norwegian <laughs> freighter uh, that was crossing the Gulf, and uh, uh, during the springtime, during the migration season, and uh, and he literally watched them crossing the Gulf of Mexico. Wow! Yeah, that is fascinating. Speaking of fascinating flying birds, if you will, you are working on a new book, as I understand it, about the bald eagle. I am, T- yes. Tell me about that. Well, so the, the, um, the, the title of the book is uh, Bird of Paradox, uh, How the Bald Eagle Saved the Soul of America. And it's, the, it's a natural and cultural history of the bald eagle, which of course is our national bird, has sure. been since 1782. Right. Uh, and everybody wants to know, about, and it tells me about their Ben <laughs> Franklin stories, and they all get it wrong. Uh, so I'll, <laughs> I'll correct it in the book. Okay. Um, but in any case, everybody thinks that Ben Franklin uh, wanted the turkey as the national bird, and he didn't go that far. He just didn't want the bald eagle. <laughs> but in any case, you know, it's, this, is a, this is a bird that everybody loves. Yeah. I, I don't care what your political background is. You right. love the bald eagle, Absolutely. and it's a fascinating conservation success story. Uh-huh. We almost wiped it out in the lower U.S. Um, and, uh, but it also the bald eagle represents in its comeback, represents our own connection to the, the natural world. We've cleaned up its waters, thanks mm. again to the 72 Clean Water Act. We've, we've protected its habitat, um, and it is the most popular wildlife cam, the bald eagle nest cams are, most popular wildlife cams in the world. Uh, we've shared our environment with the bald eagle, and we love doing that. Yeah. Uh, and we haven't diminished our quality of life. We've, if anything, we've, in, we've, in, we've improved it. Yeah. Um, and, and if you go back to the very beginning of this country, our national identity is directly linked to the natural endowments of this country because that's what distinguished us, made us different and better, I should say, yeah. than European nations. They didn't have the natural endowments that we had. And they would come visit and see what we had in terms of our, 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 our natural environments, in terms of our woodlands and our rivers and our streams and our, and our lakes and, and the wildlife. And it blew their minds. They'd never seen anything like it. What's your favorite part about writing? Do you, because I've, I've asked a lot of writers this, is it the actual sitting down and writing or is it the research part? It's, for me, it's an actual sitting down and writing cause, uh, because that's where most of the creative, that's most of the creative uh, exercise comes in. And I, and I love, I revise and I revise and I revise. I'm, uh, I'm recrafting all the time. And, uh, and I just love that part. I love looking for different ways of saying things. I love looking for good action verbs. Uh, I'll read somebody's book. Lauren Groff, a lot of people know her, the best-selling 
uh, fiction writer. I love, I love her work. She's a neighbor of mine in Gainesville. And I came across a word she used in one of her stories, gamble, G-A-M-B-O-L. Uh, a, 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 a journalist once quoted me saying, gamble, as in, let's go to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that word. I said, oh, my God, I love that word. I'm going to find a place for it in the golf book. And so wow. I do the little things like that. Neat. Yeah. What's your process? I mean, are you one of these folks that are you're just very, very structured? I get up at six o'clock in the morning and write for a couple of hours every day, or is it just when the mood hits you? How do you how do you I'm, do it? I am very disciplined about writing. I write every day, even on holidays, and I okay. get up early in the morning, uh, no later than five o'clock. Five o'clock is late, uh, and I, I, you know, my mind's fresh. Is every is fresh then? Everything's quiet. Um, and uh, I'll write for as long as I can. I may have class a day, so I, you know, I have to go on, uh, on the campus. Uh, um, but I, I won't pump myself dry, as Ernest Hemingway used to say. I'll stop at a good place, uh, and so I'll have a good writing day the, the, ne uh, the, the next day. Uh, as far as outlines, I'm, I don't create rigid outlines. I put my outlines on for each chapter on Post-its okay. and put them on my my file cabinet next to me. That way I can shift things around. I don't have to follow an outline like a, you're following a traffic cop. Right, right. Some people, For some writers, that works wonderfully. Right, right. For me, I like the surprises. I like to get up in the morning, start writing, and not be quite clear where I'm going, and to indeed let the writing show me how it wants, what direction it wants to go, uh, how the history, and have, let the history show me how it wants to be written. And I come across all these wonderful surprises uh -huh. all the time. Uh, what do you do if you're out and about or in class? Do you ever have a situation where something like, "Wow, that'd be really good for the book"? Write it down. Go, go write it down. Or you know, now with the you know the iPhones, the iPhones, I just I, I text it to myself. Yeah, that that yeah. happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. What makes a good writer? Uh, I think uh, what makes a good writer is someone who's committed, somebody who uh, reads a lot and who reads not just for the the pleasure of reading, but studies the reading of others. Um, and takes lessons from, from, from the reading. You know, writing is, uh, becoming a good writing is similar to becoming a good pianist. It takes practice mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it takes repetitive practice. And, but, so three R's. Here are the three R's to writing. Okay. Revise, revise, revise. <laughs> I like that. I yeah. like that. I like yeah. that. Well, you would certainly know he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. The book is The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. Jack Davis is the author of that. He won a Pulitzer Prize for it. He's got uh, several other books in his repertoire as well. And, of course, uh, go to Amazon. You can find them all, and I'm sure where else. Or support your local bookstore. Page and, pa Page and Palette has sold hundreds of the, this uh, book. Uh, and the other, the other independents yeah, uh, around absolutely. the Gulf. Absolutely, yeah. yes. I, I, I agree, yeah. Support them. And you've got a new book you're working on about the bald eagle. So what's ballpark me time frame when that'll... Uh, I'm hoping it'll be out in 2021 because 2022 is the 240th anniversary of the um, uh, the adoption of the bald eagle as the, as the national bird. To Ben Franklin's chagrin. Awesome, awesome. Well, Jack, all the very best. It was yeah, a pleasure. Thank you. My Great. Pleasure. Enjoy it. Yeah. And uh, have fun down at the University of Florida and go Gators, huh? <laughs> <laughs> We've been visiting with Jack Davis. And again, the book is The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. It is a Pulitzer Prize winning book. And Jack is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, obviously. You can see more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon.